Okay, chapter nine. The mice were about the size of a full-grown house cat back home. Their pink bodies were covered in a downy layer of gray fuzz. The sudden light seemed to pain their eyes, and they buried their faces in one another's sides. Like Chevy, yep. They were squeaking in fear and distress. Ooh, baby mouses! M is for mouses! cried Boots. She wiggled off her chair and hurried over to crouch beside the basket and pet their fur. Hi! Hi, you! They are hungry, said Hazard. He took a loaf of bread from the table and sat beside Boots. The two kids broke off bits of bread and fed the mice, who gobbled down the food ravenously. Hazard made soft, squeaking sounds that were indistinguishable from the baby's noises. Boots giggled as a little muzzle rubbed against her palm. You tickle, she said, but no one else was laughing. The underlanders' faces expressed deep concern. You say this basket was pulled from the river, said Vickis. Yes, to the north of us, said Merith. It is one of our own making. Vickis fingered the woven lid. We send gifts of grain to the nibblers near the fount in such baskets. How could someone have done this, said Merith, putting the, these pups on the river in this frail vessel? It is a miracle they survived. Gregor had to agree. He had been on that river in a small boat. The current was so powerful it churned the water to a white froth and carried along large boulders like they were ping pong balls. If someone wanted to kill them, this seems an elaborate way to do it, said Vickis. Who would go to the trouble to place them in a basket and set it on the river? It was their mother, said Hazard simply. He fetched a bowl of stew from the table and fed the mice bites. She put them in here and told them to stay quiet. Oh, Hazard, can you understand what they are saying? said Vickis. Some of it. They talk like babies, he said. Ask them why their mother did this, said Luxa. Howard squeaked back and forth with the mice. I can't tell exactly. Something bad was happening and all the nibblers were very afraid. Tell them that they are safe here with us, that no harm will come to them, said Vickis. Put them in the old nursery. Have Dulcet care for them. And Hazard, perhaps you could visit them with them from time to time so that they may communicate with us? He shook his head. I must alert the council of this. Gregory Luxa, Hazard, and Boots accompanied the guards and the mice to the old nursery. Dulcet, the really nice nanny who usually looked after Boots, arrived almost immediately. She instructed the guards to bring in plenty of torches, and when the room was brightly illuminated, it at least seemed less creepy. The stone animals were not so intimidating, and now Gregor could see that each creature had a fun little song carved next to it, like Bat Bat, or the thing about the nibblers, except the evil turtle. Sandwich hadn't given it a song. Dulcet cleared out an alcove in the room and fashioned a large, comfortable nest out of blankets. Then she sat cross-legged in the middle of the nest, nest and spent a few minutes with each mouse, talking to it in a soft voice, cuddling it, and giving it bites of what looked like carrots. Soon they were all vying for her attention, trying to sit on her lap, rubbing their noses under her hands so she would stroke their heads. You would have thought she'd been a mouse nanny her whole life. Of course, Boots and Hazard had to get into the nest, too. Soon, the two kids and six mice were all snuggled around Dulcet in a comfortable heap. She began to quietly sing the children's songs from the walls. It did not take long for the exhausted mouse babies to fall asleep. Luxa pulled Gregor into the hallway where they would not be overheard. We must go to the Nibbler colony by the fount, she said. No, no thanks, said Gregor, and started off down the hall. He did not want to go on any more secret adventures with Loxa, or even talk to her, really. Not after what she'd said about him enjoying the slaughter. We must find out what provoked a mother to place her pups on that river, Loxa said, following him. Maybe she was crazy. I can't think of any other reason, said Gregor. You can think of no reason you might place boots in a basket and leave her to, to the fate of the waters, Loxa insisted. Gregor! She grabbed his arm and swung him back around. No, said Gregor, wrenching his arm back. Will you just back off? 
You did as much in the jungle, said Laksa. What? said Gregor. In the jungle, you sent Boots away with Aurora, who was wounded, and Hazard, who was but six, when the cutters came, said Laksa. Yeah, because she would have been killed if I hadn't, said Gregor. Laksa's meaning was beginning to dawn on Gregor. Something very frightening had been happening when the babies had been placed in the basket. The mother had had no choice. What do you need, Vanessa? It says you raised your hand. Okay. Inside the nursery, one of the mouse babies had begun to cry out in its sleep. So you, so you think the snakes attacked the colony near the fount too? Gregor asked. No, the twisters cannot live outside the jungle. It is too cold for them, said Luxa. We do not know that they attack Sivian's colony either, only that they attacked us. The nibblers may have left for reasons that had nothing to do with the twisters who then took advantage of their absence to occupy the land. I guess so, Luxa, said Gregor. She was holding out hope that her friends were still alive, but it seemed like a long shot to him. Something is very wrong if both the nibblers in the jungle and the ones at the fount are in trouble. Perhaps every nibbler in the underland is in peril. I need your help, Gregor, said Luxa. She looked so unhappy. Less than a day ago, they had been dancing. Now, Sivian was dead. The rest of the jungle colony had probably been eaten by snakes. The basket of baby mice had arrived, indicating more tragedy, this time for the nibblers by the fount. Gregor could feel himself weakening. Maybe we should just let the council handle this. They will do nothing. Not without days of deliberation, said Luxa. I do not know if Aurora and I can face this alone. Please. Whatever remnants of resistance Gregor had melted away with that word. All right, he said, let's check out the colony. There was no way to leave until the next morning. For one thing, Aurora and Eris were exhausted from the jungle excursion and had to rest. For another, Gregor and Luxa couldn't sneak out through the nursery now that the baby mice were there, so they had to leave by a legitimate route. Luxa decided the best thing would be to tell everyone they were going on a picnic, which would allow them to take along food for the long trip to the Nibbler's colony by the fount. Gregor got permission from his mom to stay over a second night. Since he hadn't slept in two days, he was ready to go to bed as soon as supper ended, but he made one last visit to the museum to prepare for the next day's travels. As a precaution, Gregor kept a supply of fresh batteries in the museum at all times. He put them, along with three flashlights, some duct tape, and a liter bottle of water in a backpack. These things were now standard supplies on any long trip. After a moment's consideration, he added a pair of binoculars he'd found when he was digging around looking for things to sell. They were real binoculars, not the toy kind, and seemed like a cool thing to have on a trip. Since most of the underland was in darkness, he wasn't sure when he'd get a chance to use them. What he really needed was a pair of those infrared night goggles, but Central Park drew a lot of bird watchers, not commandos. As arranged, he met up with Luxa, Aurora, and Eris in the high hall early the next morning. Luxa's eyes were reddened and somewhat puffy. He wondered if she had slept at all or spent the night weeping for her friends. A couple of servants finished securing a huge picnic basket on Eris's back and left. I told the cook you eat like a shiner, Luxus told Gregor, giving the hamper a nod. Shiner was the underland word for firefly. Gregor had met two fireflies, Photos Glow Glow and Zap, and they were both absolute gluttons and unbelievably obnoxious. 